So I got the text for this morning on the back of the bulletin. And we're going to be covering the same passage that we covered last week, only we're going to be uh, looking at an, yet another section of this that is uh, so critical to the rest of the study. And that, as you can see from the title, God Does Not Lie. 1997, uh, a film comedy made its way across. It's called Liar, Liar. And uh, the premise was that the main character is a lawyer. And when his little boy introduces him at career day at school, he says, my dad wasn't able to be here. Well, what does he do? He's a liar. Don't you mean lawyer? And the kid was confused. No. <laughs> and the premise is that this little cute, adorable kid is granted his birthday wish. That for one whole day, his daddy, his daddy literally cannot lie. After years of broken promises, divorcing his mother, not showing up for the baseball game or the birthday, failures, the kid gets it. Just tell the truth. If you're not going to be there, say you're not going to be there. Well, of course, it's Hollywood and hilarious chaos ensues and a warm-hearted reconciliation is actually encouraging that the parents get back together and are remarried. Good, happy ending. But we're so used to lies being a part of our everyday life. Think of it. What's the old joke? How can you tell when a politician is lying? His lips are moving. And we, we write. Stereotype, generalization. I know not all politicians are like that. I actually gave money to one one time. One time. Ron Paul. Yeah. <clears throat> we even think in terms of, well, that's just a little white lie. It's not going to hurt anybody. We grant affirmations to half-truths, but a half-truth is no truth. It only tells part of the story. So the main theme here, again, in Titus, faith and works, the relationship between our faith and what we do. And Paul's motive is that he wants healthy churches to flourish and to conquer the island of Crete, or as, as Jesus said in Jerusalem, Samaria, to the uttermost ends of the earth. All authority is mine. But can we trust what God has said in his word? Can we trust that this Great Commission isn't just a fool's errand. You know, it's just going to get worse and worse, and then Jesus, take me away. Okay. So let's read the text again. We're going to concentrate on this passage about God not lying. So verse 1, Paul, a servant of God and an apostle of Jesus Christ, for the faith of God's elect and the knowledge of the truth that leads to godliness, a faith and knowledge resting on the hope of eternal life, which God, who does not lie, promised before the beginning of time. And at his appointed season, he brought his word to light through the preaching entrusted to me by the command of God, our Savior, to Titus, my true son in our common faith, grace and peace from God the Father and Christ Jesus, our Savior. This is God's perfect word. One thing to immediately notice, and I hope this pops out at you as you read through the book of Titus, is that Paul interchanges the names of our Savior. Right here in verse 3, he says, God, our Savior. And then in verse 4, he says, Christ Jesus, our Savior. Is this intentional? Or is Paul forgetting what he wrote? No, of course it is. Titus is a very Trinitarian letter. Paul goes to great pains to emphasize the unity of God in all of his being and purposes and the diversity that is in the Godhead itself. In chapter 3, he also mentions this, the kindness of God our Savior. And then he goes on and says, the Holy Spirit, whom he poured out upon us richly through Jesus Christ our Savior. There is no doubt as to what Paul's theology is about the nature of God. There's one being and three divine persons. As James White says, it's easy to remember because to this day, people want to confuse and they'll say, oh, you believe in three different gods. How can you say? It's like, it's easy. We're talking about one what and three who's. Quick Trinitarian lesson. We're going to study the Trinity some Lord's Day and 
series. One what, three who's. One being, three persons. One God, Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. Amen. Hallelujah. This is what we confess with all Christians everywhere. So, last week we considered the subject of the elect and who they are and how they come to be elect. And this letter, again, remember, written to a very young church in the middle of highly deceptive and worldly community, and no doubt beginning to feel the slings and arrows of mockery and just being broadly made fun of as Christians, these new religions. While we have Zeus, but what's wrong with our gods? Well, <laughs> I think for, they're not real gods. They're fake. They're false. And they, like us, are resting on, we could say, standing on the, what? Promises of God. Right. We're standing on God's promises to, right now. I don't know what's going on out there. Stuff is falling, chaos, wreaths. No. <laughs> but so, can they rely on God to deliver on his promises? That's, that's what Paul is saying here. After all, the gods that they previously worshipped were inveterate liars. Deceiving and being deceived themselves. It's like if we gave... Bart Simpson, all this supernatural power. You know who Bart is. He's constantly fudging on the truth and getting into trouble. And that's the Greek pantheon of gods. They're just big, grown-up versions of us. They're demonic versions of fallen men and women. So in the pantheon of the gods that the, the Cretans would have been uh, uh, worshiping, they're used to lies. So the point is, from the beginning, this has been the very method by which the enemy has put a wedge between God and man. It's by lying, by deceiving, manipulating, fooling us into thinking that God is actually untrustworthy. How was the woman deceived? We, we read last year that only men can be overseers because why? Well, the woman was deceived. The man was responsible. He's standing right there. Adam, come on, wake up, dude. No. The woman was deceived. How was she deceived? Well, Genesis 3, 1 says, the serpent was more crafty, clever. His, his rhetoric was smooth and went down easy. Sounds good. More crafty than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. And he said to the woman, who can tell? What did he say? What's, what came out of his mouth? Has God really? King James, hath God said? I kind of like the KJV because it rings. Right. Indeed, has God said you shall not eat of any tree in the garden? Really? Indeed, has God said this beguiling and attractive proposition. It, it wasn't just about eating food. It was an attempt to dethrone God from his position of creator and judge as the fount of all wisdom and knowledge of truth itself and simultaneously an attempt to place man on that throne. And what he was really doing, if we go back to Genesis 1.26, is he was taking dominion from the man and giving it to himself. Remember, Adam is God's vice regent. God owns everything. And we are the, we're the stewards. We make culture from his creation. And what the devil was doing was basically saying, why don't you, why don't you just exchange all that and give it to me by obeying me rather than God, by believing my lie rather than what your gracious Father has told you. So let's look at what this means for Titus and for us. God here, a God who is referred to as one who does not lie. Very important, not only culturally, but theologically through all history, we serve a God who does not lie. Let's explore this. So in the, Greece, in, the, in the Greek language, New Testament written in Greek, it's the phrase theos aseudes, uh, let me get this right, asudes, apsudes, pseudo. What is, does that sound familiar? 
pseudo, pseudes. So it's a compound. We know what theos is. It's God, theology, theos. And the word asudes is another one of these compound words. So pseudo or pseudes is where we get phrases like, well, that's pseudoscience or pseudojournalism. It means it's false. It's not genuine. Designed to deceive into believing that they're the real McCoy, but they're not. In fact, in, in Galatians 2.4, Paul, Paul speaks of this group of men who have snuck into the church to spy out their freedom. He calls them pseudodelphoi, pseudo brothers, not real, not genuine Christians. He was talking about the Judaizers, which are a threat to the church in Crete as well. So when you add the letter A to a Greek word, what does it do? It negates it. So a person who is an atheist is a non-theist. He doesn't believe in one God. He's against that. It's the opposite. So you add the letter A to pseudo and you get not false or an absence of falsity. So God is a pseudes. He is not false. And even more, he is incapable of being false. And this is throughout all the Bible. You'd be blind to miss it. I remember in a Bible study once back at, at Trinity, and we were still meeting in the auditorium, and somebody said, well, maybe God is incapable only insofar as he chooses not to lie. And I know what they were trying to do. Protect God's sovereignty. He can do all things. He can't lie. He's incapable of lying. He would cease to be God. That would be impossible. Numbers 23, 19, God is not man that he should lie or a son of man that he changes his mind. Has he said and he will not do it? Has he spoken and he will not fulfill it? Of course not. Whatever God decrees, that will take place. Whatever he speaks will happen. God is not fickle or capricious like we are. He's not a man that he should lie or change his mind. 1 Samuel 15, 29, also, the glory of Israel will not lie or change his mind, speaking there of Yahweh, for he is not a man that he should change his mind. Interesting. Think about how the Old Testament writers are pointing lying as a characteristic of man and contrasting that with God. Guess what? All the Greek gods lied. It's on record. They deceived in order to do what they wanted to do. Don't get me started. It was all part of their character. And like man, like we all lie, but God does not. He does not conform to an external standard of honesty or right and wrong. In fact, he is the standard. Jesus repeated it in John 14, 6. I am the way and the truth. It's embodied in God himself. As A.W. Tozer has said and written, he is absolutely holy with an infinite, incomprehensible fullness of purity that is incapable of being other than it is. He's also referred to as the God of truth in the Old Testament. Psalm 31.5, you've ransomed me, O Lord, God of truth. His character as being holy precludes him from lying. It should be a comfort then to us that we obey a God who will never lead us astray. He will never contradict himself. He doesn't double speak. He's not double tongued. And he will never fail to fulfill what he has promised. That's the point of Paul writing here in Titus uh, chapter 1. The promise, the hope of eternal life, which rests on God who does not lie. Wonderful. Isn't that good news? You could be promised all kinds of things from all kinds of devil gods, and they're just pulling your leg. Isaiah 65, 16, because he who is blessed in the earth will be blessed by the God of truth. And he who swears in the earth will swear by the God of truth. There's a, there's a word that we use to describe the state of being incapable of being false. We usually use it when we're talking about the Bible. It's inspired, it's inerrant, it's authoritative. What other... N word do we use? Anyone? 
infallible. What a great word. God is infallible. He's not able to be false. And this has incredible importance when we think of our relationship with God. We take it for granted. But Paul, again, distinguishing between the one true God and all the false gods, every single one. He's also giving us a solid ground upon which to stand regarding our own trust and faith. Think of this, the, the, the author of Hebrews, and again, I always say that because I'm not sure who it is. It could be Apollos or Barnabas, it could have been Paul. No one really knows. We just know that it's apostolic in nature. Whoever wrote Hebrews had more insight into the Old Testament than I think most Bible professors do today. Hebrews 6, and again, Hebrews written to Jewish Christians who are tempted to go back to the old ways. So when God desired, this is in verse 17 and 18, so when God desired to show more convincingly to the heirs of the promise, there's that word again, promise, the unchangeable character of his purpose, he guaranteed it with an oath, so that by two unchangeable things, it is impossible for God to lie, we who have fled for refuge might have strong encouragement to hold fast to the hope set before us. So when we read of the promises of God here in Titus chapter 1, verses 2 and 3 of our text, of faith and knowledge resting on the hope of eternal life, which God, who does not lie, promised before the beginning of time. If I said we can bank on that, that would be diminishing the importance of what was just said. Of course we can. We can utterly and completely trust that God is able and willing to accomplish all of this. And he does it in his time as well. Romans 3.3, what if some were unfaithful? Because this is oftentimes the the question that comes up in our circles is, well, if God's promises are true, then what about those people that fell away from the faith? Was the promise not true for them? Well, let's read what what does Paul write in Romans 3.3. What if some were unfaithful? Does their faithlessness nullify the faithfulness of God? In other words, when people say yes to Jesus and then later on say no to Jesus and yes to idols, and I use idols as anything that would distract from God, does that mean that God's promise failed for them? What does Paul say? Mm -mm. No. By no means. Let God be true, though everyone were a liar as it is written, that you may be justified in your words and prevail when you, judged, when you are judged. You see, when, that, when something like that takes place, God is, God is not the one failing at that point. That person who said yes to Jesus and now says no to Jesus is turning their back on what they know to be true. Those promises are still true. If they repent, amen. Come back to Christ. Stop this insanity, right? As long as there's breath, amen? And we, again, like I said last week, we don't don't know what God's decreed. We don't know the end of the story yet. And I've said it before, I always get it wrong. I have these tattooed up rock bands in my studio and one guy's really nice and sweet and the other guy's a foul mouth lecher. Guess which one ends up getting saved? It's not the nice guy. It's usually the guy who's, I just can't, I can't, no, no, I can't figure it out. That's because God's the one doing it. So not only that he can and will accomplish all this, but he's doing it, as I said before, he's doing it according to his own timetable, in his time. Verse 3 says that at his appointed season, he brought his word to light through the preaching entrusted to me by the command of God our Savior. That's another key here to the fact that God doesn't lie. Remember, the promise to Abraham in Genesis was that his descendants would be like the sand on the seashore and the stars in the heavens. The promise to the the man in the garden, the woman, was that by the seed of the woman, the serpent is going to be destroyed and wiped out. All of these promises and these covenant uh, decrees and oaths that God made They weren't just dependent on you and I or anyone or or situations. They're utterly dependent on God. In other words, his timing is perfect. 
I, I said this last year about the Reformation. The Reformation didn't happen in 1417 when Jan Hus was preaching in Prague. God wasn't ready for it yet. One of the reasons that we speculate is that well, the printing press wasn't up and running. And the printing press was one thing in history that made the, pro the, the process of, of spreading the gospel of God's free grace a possibility in Europe. It's almost like the internet today. It was that radical. So God does these things in his time. Galatians 4, 4 and 5. But when the fullness of time had come, God sent forth his son born of a woman. So one other thing to take note of, remember from last week, Paul is going through all of these trials and beatings and shipwrecks and imprisonments. For what reason? Remember, it's for the sake of the faith of God's elect. And one of the straw man arguments, you know what a straw man is, anyone? So a straw man is made in the image of the real man, and he's really easy to knock over or to set on fire. It's where you misrepresent someone's argument in order to seem like you've actually handled their argument. You haven't really. You've knocked down a straw man. Now come at me. I'm a real man. I'm a little tougher to knock over, right? One of the straw man arguments is when they, when they talk about God's electing and his purpose is an election according to his own uh, will. He says, is that they say this, and I've heard this many times. So you're telling me that God just arbitrarily chooses some and arbitrarily denies the chance of salvation to others, huh? Well, what word cannot be in that sentence if we're talking about God? Arbitrarily. It's not chooses, it's not denies, as if God is obligated. It's the word arbitrary. How could God, who does not lie, how could the God of truth itself be arbitrary in any sense of the word? To be arbitrary is just random, and it's just a choice or a personal whim rather than any substantial reason. Remember, we can be fickle. We can, cha we can change our minds. We we'll make choices based on, oh, I don't know, I feel like strawberry today, when really your favorite flavor is chocolate. Everyone knows. But, yeah, whatever. Do you want spicy food? Rather not. Well, maybe this once. Wow. I always thought Bob didn't like spicy food. We're, we can make random, arbitrary choices out of the blue, but not God. God does never, never does anything arbitrarily based on chance. And remember, when Paul's distinguishing the God of the Bible from the false gods, this is exactly what they're like. Did you know that Allah is fickle and arbitrary? You can say the Shahada. You can live as uprightly as possible. You can pray five times a day. And at the very end of your life, God, Allah, sorry. <clears throat> at the very end of your life, Allah can say, nope, not good enough. Off to hell with you. Totally fickle. Utterly untrustworthy. And all of the false gods in the Greek pantheon, there's, there's no truth in them. But not Yahweh, not, not the God of the Bible. This is not who he is. And he is infallible. Now, I said before we use this word infallible about the Bible. We're using it as about God. Now, can we make that connection between God's infallibility and the Bible's infallibility? Well, yeah, absolutely. Follow, follow this argument. Follow this logic. So, number one, God is infallible. That means he cannot lie. Number two, he has told us that he has revealed himself in propositional form. In other words, in writing, in scripture. He's also told us that this scripture came about as men were carried along by the spirit. That's the, that's the process of inspiration. This book claims inspiration for itself. Paul says, my first sermon here, back a year and a half ago, um, all scriptures God breathed. Every bit of it, inspired of God, breathed out by God. So if the Bible makes this claim about itself, now anyone can make a claim, right? But Scripture does not lie, therefore Scripture is infallible. Now I know someone's going to say, oh, there's a, there's a logical leap that you took there in the middle. But remember that 
we're not subjecting the Bible to some kind of scientific litmus test of truth. If anyone here this morning believes that Jesus is the Son of God and confesses him as Lord, you're doing it because the Spirit of God granted you a heart of faith. When, you, when God does this, though, and I've heard testimony after testimony, we see it through the Bible as well, especially in the, in the book of Acts, the New Testament. One day, this book made no sense to me. One day, I just thought it was a bunch of gibberish. And for some strange reason, the next day I picked it up and I couldn't get enough of it. What happened? What changed? Well, their perspective, their heart changed, really. Their perspective changed as a result of a heart change. See, the problem is that once you grant that the Bible is, is fallible, in any point, there, there's a kind of a fancy term that people use when they're describing what you believe about the Bible's inspiration. It's verbal and plenary. It's two different things. Verbal and plenary are talking about not, not, talking about not just the ideas are infallible, but the very words themselves are infallible. This is why when I, when I see modern versions literally expunging Greek concepts like the word malakos from 1 Corinthians 6, malakos, you know what that means? Soft man, effeminate. And they say, well, that's just part of being homosexual, so we'll take the soft man out and just make one word. Paul didn't do that. He said, malakos arsenokoite. Or what about at the end of 1 Corinthians 16? Be courageous like men. It's in the Greek language. Like men is there. But let's, take, let's just say be courageous. Why do people do These are the words that God has spoken. Not just the ideas, but the very words themselves. Once you grant that the words are not infallible, or that culture can have some kind of determining factor over Scripture, it's all done. You're over. Kaput. As I wrote to a friend of mine last, well, it wasn't last year, it was a couple years ago. If you don't have an infallible, reliable text, a God-breathed, authoritative, and infallible text, here's what you'll get. Here's the result, and it always happens. Look at all of the big, huge, they call them mainline denominations that are, they're turning into nightclubs in Europe, and they're being sold off in the States because people don't, don't attend anymore. You don't have a new covenant because that was promised in an infallible world. You don't have the promised new covenant. Um, you don't have the heir of David sitting on David's throne. Who's that? Jesus. You don't have any substitutionary atonement in the Lamb of God. There's no extension of God's grace. There's no forgiveness of sins. There's no imputation of Christ's righteousness to you. No justification, no adoption into God's family, no resurrection of the dead, and certainly no verse to hope of eternal life. There's no future. In fact, if you start, this will inevitably happen. It always does. I don't know how many times it's going to take place when churches begin to grasp onto not only unbiblical ideas, but begin to squash the very words of the Bible. It happened to the, the glorious Presbyterian church. They were the stalwarts of the faith. And by the 1920s, they were victims of unbelief. Why? Because they had gotten rid of their infallibility in the infallible text of the Bible. In fact, you'll end up with no objective standards for love, for justice or mercy, or any objective basis for right and wrong. You can't account for anything not physical, like emotions or ethics or logic or rationality or even romance. There's no justification for meaning. In fact, you got no basis for knowledge itself. It's all happening up in here. Now, I'm, <laughs> I'm painting a pretty dire picture. Before I say, wow, you're just, you're really going off on this infallibility thing. Yeah, I hate to see it. This, this list of things, I wrote that to a close, personal friend of mine who was going through this supposed crisis of faith because he'd read a couple articles somewhere on on the internet and he's like well I, I just can't say that the men who wrote the bible were infallible I said you don't have to the men weren't infallible the word they wrote is infallible that you have to grant or you're calling god a liar you really want to, you really want to be there 
And then I said, trust me, you're going to lose all this because this, this is all dependent upon a text that can't be falsified. It's interesting, if we can't rely on the Bible to speak clearly like this, then really, I'm with my wife. To heck with it! If it's not objectively true, oh, if it's only for this life you hope in Christ, we're going to be pitied more than all men. 1 Corinthians 15. Exactly. And when there have been compromises on these issues surrounding God's infallibility, you're going to have compromises on God's right as our creator, to determine sexual boundaries between men and women and everything else. And you're going to have these compromises in the home and in the family and, yes, in the church. Sound doctrine has been compromised, the Word of God maligned. And as we're going to read later on this year, Titus 2.5, the Word of God will actually be blasphemed because now we're no longer treating it as the Word of God. It's like a self-help manual. So God not only does what is consistent with his nature, so does his word. He cannot lie. When Paul emphasized that God does not lie, he was not only giving Titus practical teaching tool, but he was also showing the distinction between the church in, in Crete and the church, or the, uh, the unbelieving temples in Crete as well. So what about you? Are, are you... Do, do we walk as those who cannot lie? Well, we're not infallible. What about those who do not lie? Why do we lie? I, mean, I lied last week. I was on the phone, and I padded my resume for no reason at all. It was the stupidest thing. I'm confessing sin to the congregation. And I hung up the phone, and I said, You idiot! There was... There was no reason for that. You said a couple when the truth was one. Why? Ah, I beat myself up, confessed my sin. I'm sorry, God. That's, I... Well, to one group of people who lied a lot, Jesus said this. You are of your father, the devil, and you want to do the desires of your father. He was a murderer from the beginning and does not stand in the truth because there is no truth in him. Whenever he speaks a lie, he speaks from his own nature, for he is a liar and the father of lies. Yeah, Jesus is talking to the Pharisees in John chapter 8, and he's calling them sons not of Abraham, but of the devil. And he says, when the devil lies... That's coming from his nature. Nature precedes our will, not the other way around. We lie for any number of reasons. Now, Satan doesn't lie because he wants humans to avoid the pain that the truth oftentimes brings. Rather, he lies because he hopes that we will be deceived and believe what is false and then reject what God has said, just like he did in the garden in Genesis chapter 3. Sometimes we, we do lie to get out of the pain that telling the truth will bring. It's like avoiding confrontation. I just, it's going to hurt. Sometimes we lie to get out of trouble. We lie to become more important in someone else's eyes. To seem more experienced, even to put one over on the other persons. That's what the Cretans did all the time. They lied so they would get the upper hand in business. Remember Proverbs says, uh, this is no good, no good. And then later on, the guy comes back and buys it at a cheap price. It's all deception. To gain something we don't have. Proverbs 21.6, the getting of treasures by a lying tongue is a fleeting vapor and a snare of death. Wow. And liars are addicted to impure and divisive talk. Proverbs 17, 4, an evildoer listens to wicked lips. A liar pays attention. He listens to that destructive tongue. See, God wants truth in the inmost parts. He doesn't just want outward conformity. He wants us to be true, first of all, to him and to his word, to ourselves and then to others. Lying lips are what? An abomination to the Lord. Those who deal faithfully are his delight. 
There are promises that attend telling the truth. Who is the man that desires life and loves length of days that he may see good? Psalm 34, 12 and 13. Keep your tongue from evil and your lips from speaking deceit. One of the other things to notice about people who lie and who it's their nature to lie, they're given to it, is that it's almost always accompanying some other wickedness. It's always attached to other sins. Look at the list that Paul gives as signifying that God has given someone over to a reprobate or depraved mind in Romans 1. Beginning in verse 29, you being filled with all unrighteousness, wickedness, greed, evil, full of envy, murder, strife, right smack dab in the middle of it is deceit. Malice, they are gossips, slanderers, haters of God, on and on. Qualification for elder and deacon in 1 Timothy 3. Deacons must be men of dignity, not double-tongued. They can't say one thing here and the different thing over there and have it all add up. And liars have to create more lies in order to justify and cover up the lies they told previously. There's a great YouTube channel where the guy examines politicians and their body language and what they do. It's right there, see, he's lying. You know, the tell, all those things that we unconsciously do while we're making stuff up in our mind to cover up the lies we told last week. <laughs> now, Christian, we, we cannot be like this. We must be marked and characterized by the truth. Our Lord, his very nature is truth itself, the God of truth. I am the way and the truth and the life. So his children, his adopted sons and daughters, must also be marked by truth-telling, by honesty in all our dealings. I'm not talking about, does this dress make me look heavy? Yeah, that's, that's a little different. I would say absolutely not compared to that woman over there. No. Telling the truth is one indication of, of inward godliness. And the, the Bible says, be sure your sins will find you out. There's, it's so sad when you meet people who continue in this practice. And, and now they're not only deceiving others, but what does the Bible say? They're deceiving and being deceived. They're deceived by their own lying. And I'm sure we've all known people in the past where they actually end up believing their own lies. And they're surprised when you don't agree with them because you know different. It's horrible. And we know God sees our hearts. He knows what our motives are. He judges our attitudes. God judged my attitudes last week. A couple. No, one. There was only one, not a couple. A few. Oh, what, what was I doing? I was trying to make myself look good to the person on the phone. I didn't have to. What, what a wicked man. God, forgive me. So to tie this up and conclude, God's promises to us are made ever more sure when we consider the fact that God cannot lie. He is utterly trustworthy. The Old Testament word for God's faithfulness is hesed, H-E-S-E-D. And it is, it is spoken of God over and over and over again through the, through the Psalms, the book of Ruth, his hesed faithfulness to his covenant promises. So here we are, November 25th, 2018. Is that right? Man, I'm getting, I'm getting ready for the new year. So, um, Do the promises that God made to Abraham, are they still in play? Absolutely. Absolutely. We know this for a number of reasons. But number one, um, Jesus rose from the dead. So those promises that God made to Abraham and the Messiah and all of the old covenant promises took place as a matter of fact, as a matter of history. So we trust everything Jesus said. And he said, if you take up your cross and follow me and deny yourself, you'll go where I'm going. Where did Jesus go? He ascended to the right hand of the Father, where he is now seated 
and all of his enemies are slowly but surely being made a footstool for his feet, for he must reign until he has done this. So folks, right now, at this time, even in this little corner country church, we are the beneficiaries of all of these old covenant promises. Rejoice in that. Don't take it for granted. Know that what you stand upon is truth itself. And there's no atheist, no unbeliever out there that should be able to shake you from that position of faith and trust. Remember, everyone else is a liar. As it says in Romans, let every man be a liar, but let God be true. God has spoken, and we can, we can take it to the bank, as it were, infallibly. All right, let's pray. Lord, you've been so gracious and kind to us, and we thank you for revealing yourself in a way that we can understand. Thank you for being the God of truth. And Lord, we freely acknowledge without your work in our hearts, we would, we would still be deceived as far as our as regarding our, our own condition, the wickedness of our own sinfulness, our alienation from you. Lord, we, we grieve when we see people who absolutely need the gospel who don't think they need the gospel. They're being deceived. Lord, help us to be agents of truth. Let us also speak the truth in love with the motive of seeing men and women, boys and girls, uh, really, really... Uh, embrace life and life eternal through your son and we thank you again help us to be people of truth truth tellers and not to be double-tongued in any of our ways in jesus name amen